Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hey, everybody. I am very happy to have you here, Andrew Pledger, on our show this week. He has now become part of the podcast team, and there's going to be a special outro, the one more thing before you go, after my conversation with him, a unique way of doing it, and you'll find out what it is at the end of the show. Andrew Pledger is a religious trauma survivor who was raised in fundamentalist Christianity. He was homeschooled his entire life for the purpose, he says, of indoctrination. His parents would only pay for a Christian university, and he chose Bob Jones University. Andrew kept his sexuality a secret until his mental health declined due to repressing emotions, sexuality, and religious trauma. For his last year of college, he created a photo series that depicted religious trauma. It was to bring awareness to religious trauma, and he appeared on Josh Harris's IGTV show to talk about his photo series. Bob Jones University was made aware of the video, and he was expelled his last semester of his college career. These experiences have inspired him to pursue psychology to help religious trauma survivors. And he is now on a mission of his own, using social media to share his story and bring awareness to religious trauma. Here is Andrew now. I cannot tell you how happy I am to have Andrew on the podcast today. So I would love for you to take a few moments and introduce yourself to the people listening so they have a sense of who you are and also what brings you to the show. So my name is Andrew Fledger, and I grew up in an independent fundamental Baptist church. I was homeschooled my entire life, and I went to Bob Jones University for my college career, and I recently got expelled from BJU for a video I was in with Joshua Harris. Um, I was on his Instagram live show and Bob Jones University did not like some of the things that I said in the video. And so they decided to expel me. So now that I'm actually free from this toxic environment that I've really been in my whole life, now I am taking and using my voice to speak up about spiritual abuse and emotional and any kind of abuse that is going on in these institutions and how it's able to happen so frequently. And I feel like the more people start talking about it, the more change that can happen because it's such an elephant in the room in these environments. So now that I'm free, I can say whatever I want. (laughs) They can't hurt me anymore. (laughs) And part of my journey is just knowing just if people know that they're not alone, like that is so powerful. There are so many people who are struggling with things. And it's very common for us as human beings to feel like this is only happening to me. I'm so alone. And you're just afraid to speak up about it. But hearing someone else that goes through a similar situation, you're like, I'm not the only one. Like This is an issue that is really going on in this environment. So for me, that's what I feel like my purpose in my life is to bring awareness to this issue. And I studied photography at Bomb Shows University. And how the video with Joshua Harris started was I created a photo series. It was specifically a fine art photo series. And for those of you who don't know what art photography is, art photography is just photography that is used as a medium to express your thoughts, your ideas, and your emotions. So You know, if you wanted to paint your emotions that one way, but photography is another medium and art you can use to express yourself. So with this photo series, I decided to do it on religious trauma. And I spent, like, it was really my senior project for my program uh, because it was just, it was so personal to me. And I really dug deep into all, and I, I mean, I discovered a lot of things about myself as I was digging and creating this project. And when I was done with it and I looked at it emotionally, 
it represented my life growing up in this environment and how I find how I found the strength to escape it. And it had very specific meanings to me. And I wanted it to be ambiguous to other people though. So I have very specific things, meanings behind it, but I made it so it would relate to a lot of people. So a lot of people would connect with it. And that's when I reached out to Joshua Harris and I was like, hey, I would love to come on your show and to talk about my photo series and what I'm doing. And I honestly, I never thought he would get back to me. Like I'm sure he can, like, I'm sure he gets so many DMs. He's he's not gonna get little old me like on his show. And when he responded, I was so, so excited for this opportunity for him to give me a platform to share and talk about my photo series. And in the video, I mainly talked about my story because that was a big context to the photo series. So I think the video is like 40 minutes long. And like the last seven minutes is like me actually talking about the photo series because I, I felt the story behind it. Um, was so important and you know I really I really prepared uh, like I probably prepared like 10 hours for it because I knew six weeks in advance what my slot was and I knew this this was going to be an incredible opportunity for me to share my story and I wanted to do it precisely and get it all the points that I could because it's hard to tell your life story in 40 minutes so I was like I'd have to hit on the important points and you know, I was really scared about doing it. And it really, Josh really changed my life because as a result of that video, I got fired from my job. I got kicked out of Bob Jones University and my entire life changed. But, you know, the universe was working it out for the better because now I'm living with the family um, in Greenville who has taken me in as one of their own and just trying to take care of me and like they drive me to therapy every week too and thankfully my parents they're paying for that and it was really a wake-up call to my parents to how much pain I was going in once this video came out I think they felt really bad about how unaware they were as I talked about religious trauma and how my experiences and fundamentalism really damaged me psychologically. And, you know, for a little history in my back in my childhood. So, you know, my parents, they met at Hiles Anderson. It was a college, it still exists, but it was big in like the 80s and 90s with the fundamentalist movement. And my dad was studying to be a pastor. My mom was going to be an English teacher. And that's where they met and they got engaged their senior year. And when they got married, um, my mom was a school teacher in the Christian school system for a few years, and she realized I don't want my children in this environment. She didn't like it, and that's when she decided that she wanted to homeschool all of her children. And the issue that I look back on now is that their main goal with it was to basically indoctrinate us with the fundamentalist perspective and. You know, I grew up in an independent fundamental Baptist church. It was Kate, King James Version only of the Bible. Like that's the only version of the Bible that's true. Any other version of the Bible was not legitimate. And women could only wear skirts in the church. Women could not speak in the church. They were always supposed to submit to a male authority figure. Extremely, extremely conservative and definitely oppressive to women. And as I look back on it, I would say the way my parents would listen to my pastor was really how everyone would. It like I look back and I'm like that that really was cult like behavior about how I went to Gospel Light Baptist Church and it was pastored by Brother Bobby Robertson for sixty plus years until he died uh, a few years ago, and he was an incredible man. He was extremely loving and kind and people drew to that they saw him as if he were like i think he's the christ himself almost and my parents would do anything that he said like he would definitely there were legalistic moments where he would add his own rules to the bible and like for example like he called it mixed bathing and it was where pre-pubescent children 
like an opposite gender swim in a swimming pool together. That's what he called that. So I wasn't allowed to swim in a swimming pool with friends of the opposite gender before, you know, before I hit puberty. So like as children, we had no idea, you know, they sexualized us at a young age. And so I was never allowed to swim in a swimming pool with the opposite gender. But I was like, I guess it was like eight through 10, basically. And I still, as I got older, wasn't allowed to, of course, in my teen years. So, <laughs> yeah. And so, and of course, as a child, I didn't understand that. And my pastor also is like, oh, like you can't go to the movie theater. That's such a bad place and blah, blah, blah. So much sin going. And I was like, they show kids movies there. I'm like, come on, dude, chill <laughs> out. And it was just this very extreme black and white type thinking. And also he would encourage parents to spank their children. And what was interesting to me is as I dug into that, they talked about like, you know, don't spare the rod. And as I looked into the actual context of that verse and shepherds, they wouldn't hit their sheep with it. Usually it was meant to guide their sheep, their rod, not to like beat the crap out of them. They're trying to protect them. Like if their sheep was like, if it was close to a cliff, they would take their staff and pull it back, not beat it. <laughs> so it was all about guidance. Once I actually learned the context of that, I was like, wow, that's what that verse means. And you know, sadly, there are some verses in the Bible that do encourage beating of your children specifically, which um, that really does bother me. That specific verse, though, when it says don't spare the rod, that's that wasn't specifically what it was referring to. So that's been part of my journey and deconstructing these beliefs is being like, OK, my pastor told me this, but what is the context behind this verse? How do they do things in the time period this was written? And who is this really meant for? And so that's kind of what I've been doing as I've been looking back on my life. I'm like, okay, what does this really mean? Did they really tell me the truth? Or was this just their personal in interpretation that was distorted by their own perspective and their own bias? And, you know, looking back at being homeschooled, like I definitely, there are benefits to it, but they're definitely negatives. And I think a big negative of it is that if you're in a home, if you're homeschooled and your parents isolate you, there are no other adult figures that you could cry out to help to. Like if your parents are bad, like you're stuck. And I was in a homeschool group, but it was still a very like Christian conservative homeschool group. And any more socialization I had, it was in the fundamentalist church. So every environment I was in, fundamentalist Christianity was like everywhere. It was so suffocating all the time. And, you know, for school, we, of course, we always had the Bible as a subject of Bible curriculum or something to indoctrinate us specifically with the fundamentalist. I know a Becca, a Becca books was. Um, a curriculum my parents loved and they used because they pushed the King James only narrative, definitely. And the thing is, is when you're isolated in this environment and you know nothing different, like I thought my parents, I'm like, oh, we're the only religion that is right. Everyone else is wrong. Like I was, it was so bad. And like, I remember my neighbors were Methodist and I thought they were evil because they weren't fundamentalist or they weren't in the back. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. And like, I look back at my younger self and I cringe, but then I have to have compassion for my younger self and be like, you know what? I was a totally different person then. And my parents did influence my view heavily of people outside of our religion. And so I was just a child. And now children, we listen to everything our parents say and we believe them. But there is a certain point where we start to realize that they're human, that they're imperfect. <laughs> as children, I guess you would say, we view them as this idol or something, this perfect example. And I think that's natural, but as we get older, that image is broken. <laughs> right. You hope it's broken. And not just because what a parent is believing is wrong, you know, just the concept of you becoming a free thinker, that you can even choose somewhere in the middle. Maybe you have similar ideas to your parents, but you want to personalize them in a way that fits for you and know that you have the freedom to do so because you want to be able to utilize your, your brain. Yes, most definitely. And like, you know, I've been in therapy for three weeks now because when I was kicked out of Bob Jones, 
I was like, this is a period of my life where I just need to rest and I need therapy. Like I've needed it for a long time. And I've had four depressive episodes throughout my life and I'm already like 22 years old. So it's like, and it's so awful when you're suffering and you don't know what is going on. You don't know what the problem is. And growing up in the fundamentalist church, if you had mental health issues, you know, it's spiritual warfare, it's demons. And if you don't pray hard enough or you don't read your Bible enough, like, oh, it's your fault. So you need to work on your relationship with Jesus. And so I would do everything the church told me growing up and it didn't make things better. And it was so fr- it's so frustrating to do the same thing over and over and to get not get different results is insanity. Right, right. Yeah, it is insanity. Yes, that is correct. And, you know, I'm also wondering if you've heard there's there was a woman who was on this show who has a, a TikTok channel, Anna, who talked about being in bed for years and just not being able to also raise, as she said, fundy and um, not not knowing what was wrong, knowing something was tremendously wrong, but not knowing what was causing it and that there was no help for it. There was some sort of no, no way of problem solving it, you know, just letting it happen or needing to pray it away somehow. So I wonder when you had your first depressive episode, how old were you and what was that about? So yeah, I had two in my teen years and then two in my college years. In my teen years, I think it was right around when I turned 16. I would say it was a mild depression at first. And then it just went like terribly into major depression. But I remember being depressed for several weeks. It was like a mild depression. And I was like, I don't know what is wrong. And I, you know, and I talked to my mom, I'm like, could you take me to the doctor? I want to be on antidepressants. Um, I've been in this sad mood for so many weeks and just hasn't gone away. I feel so heavy. And she just pushed it aside. She's like, no, she's like, you don't need to be on antidepressants at your age. Like, don't worry about it. She was, she was fearful of antidepressants because she had heard stories of like people being on a specific medication and making it worse, which it can happen because it's hard to find the right medication that works for you. And not everyone reacts to it the same way. Some people might become really nauseous from medicine. So they'd be like, okay, I had to try another one. And it's just, you're just trying medicine until you find one that fits your needs. And so that's what she was kind of worried about. She's like, I don't want to do that. And, you know, and I believe truly that it was like spiritual warfare or something. I was like, okay, I just have to read my Bible and pray because that's what I was taught. Because I had no outside information to help me because, you know, I did have, internet access but like it was restricted like I couldn't really search anything on the internet so my device had parental controls on it so I couldn't really search the web for anything and even like the books I had were even controlled by my parents like there was a point in my teen years where I started ordering books on fundamentalism in general and how it could be dangerous and when my dad because I started doubting it I'm like I don't I think something is wrong with fundamentalism and that's when I started researching I was like okay like there's got to be some book uh, on this subject. And when I ordered the book, and this is when I had gotten older and I had finally had that internet access finally. And when I ordered it and it came to mail and my dad saw it, he's like, what is this? And I was like, oh, it's a book on fundamentalism and how it can be dangerous. And that really upset him. He did not like that. He was like, was this written by a Christian? And I said, no. He's like, well, they can't interpret the Bible correctly. They don't know what they're talking about. Only a Christian, the Holy Spirit can interpret things right. And I was like, this isn't about the Bible, Dad. Like, this is about fundamentalism. It's a mindset. Like, there's many kinds of fundamentalism. Like, he didn't understand that. That it wasn't just inherent to Christianity. And so he's like, I don't want you reading it. And I was like, well, I, I bought this with my money. And he took the book away from me. He hid it in the house because that threatened his, his worldview too much. That bothered him. And he, he told me, he's like, oh, I'm worried about your faith. But what I really knew is he was worried about his worldview crumbling and falling apart. So, of course, I searched the house when he was gone during the I day. Was- Gonna say <laughs> you probably know your house pretty well. Uh-huh. I found the book. Of course, I took it back and like 
I hid it under my bed and I didn't read it for a while because I was scared of what I would find in that book because I was worried about my worldview. Like if it was destroyed, what foundation would I have? And, and you know, the curiosity, I couldn't like, I couldn't handle it anymore. And I just slowly started reading the book. And once I started reading it, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is not just a Christian issue, but this is just an issue worldwide in different religions and even political movements. And just the mindset that these people have that they have access to an absolute truth. And what happens is, is they believe fundamentally believe that they know what is best for everyone, that people, they're lost, they're unsaved, they're sinners, they're blind to the truth, and that they have the answer. They're enlightened, in a sense, to God's truth, and they know what's best for everyone. And so they want to force their religion onto everyone because it's what God wants to do. That's what they believe. And it's really, really scary to the point where this, a lot of these people don't care really about freedom of religion or like freedom of thought or freedom of speech, because I've been in churches and I've sat there and I've heard the pastor say, we need this in our government. We need our kinds, uh, our kinds of, our kind of Christianity infiltrating the government. Our country would be a much better place if every single official believed what we believed. And I sat there and I was like... <laughs> <laughs> try not to laugh out loud because it really fundamentalist Christianity. I mean, it really, it puts men in power and it belittles women. And when he, when they talked about it, I'm like, women's rights, if all fundamentalists were in the government, like people's rights, human rights would be in grave danger because they would be doing what they thought, what, you know, cause there is God. They believe they're doing what God wants. And what they don't realize is they're really projecting their own biases and prejudices onto God. They're like, oh, this is what God wants, but really it's what's going on inside of them. But they don't realize it. I don't think it's like unconscious that we project things on the people, but we don't, it's an unconscious thing that happens. And, and I think there, I don't know if you're aware, you probably are of Project Blitz. No, tell me about Project Blitz. I'm going to write this down. Oh gosh. So Project Blitz is a Christian fundamentalist nationalist movement. And it's where these group of people, I don't know how big it is, but their goal is to redefine religious freedom in favor of Christianity. So basically it's not really religious freedom. It's just favoring Christianity. And they're trying to get fundamentalist interpretation of scripture into our laws. And what they're doing is they will submit like it, when they get to the government, they submit, and it's usually it's on like a state level right now in certain states, they will submit bills, like a, pl- a plethora of so many bills, they just can't handle that. A, f- a few of them will get passed and it will slide through the cracks. And so they're going to just do so many bills, they can't handle it. And so a few will fall through and get passed just slowly and slowly get this fundamentalist uh, perspective of the law, which is. I mean, really, they want to turn our nation to a theocracy, honestly. That's really what they want. And so when I heard about this, it really scared me to think that there are these people who are just trying to override religious freedom for everyone else. They want it just for themselves, which is not religious freedom at all. And so, (laughs) and you know, I've heard people argue that, oh, well, the founding fathers, they really meant for us to be free with Christianity because that's why, you know, we came here from England. And (laughs) when I heard that, I was like, um, if you actually study the founding fathers, most of them weren't Christians at all. And they generally, they wanted freedom for everyone. And the fact that America exists for the constitution that we have, and of course the constitution is not perfect. It has some of its issues, but the fact that at a certain time in history that a country was created where men collectively wanted freedom for everyone, that is incredible. And then we have these people who are trying to change the constitution and try to limit people's rights. We're like, oh, well, this is not what religious freedom really meant. 
that's why on my Instagram, I made a post about Project Blitz because I want people to be aware of what is going on. And so, and I need to do more research into it because I don't know how, if it's growing anymore or if it's getting smaller or not, or how much success they've actually had. And, you know, these people, so first they believe what's best for everyone. So they'll infringe on anyone's rights because of this. And, you know, I, and I think part of it too, is they get this righteous high, this self-righteous high from having this extremely high standard and telling everyone, well, you're not living to this. I'm better than you. And another thing is like, there's so many psychological components, especially to religion and fundamentalism. I just wanted to clarify two things before we continue. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned here is this idea of your father being worried about you gaining access to this book. And yeah, if there's a will, there's a way you were going to find that book. But he was worried about you reading a book that wasn't by someone who was of the same tradition, faith, belief. So then it would be a misinterpretation. You said beforehand about spare the rod and the way it's interpreted being a misinterpretation. So there already there were already misinterpretations within the context of the organization and within your, your parents' environment, but they wanted to protect you from misinterpretations. <laughs> so whose misinterpretations are right, right? Yes. And this is why the fundamentalist movement was born, was because people couldn't agree on interpretation of scripture. You had all these people arguing, no, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And then they were like, okay, let's break this down into the fundamentals and let's bond together on this. And so the fundamentals, which, you know, at Bob Jones, we have a creed that we say during every single chapel it is a very creepy cult moment as we're all like 2100 or 2500 students in an auditorium all saying this creed in the same tone of voice it is just it irks me just to think about it and as i you know i i used to say it and they're like if you believe this you say this with us and so eventually as i got older i just I didn't say it anymore. I just stood there and with my mouth closed watching everyone. And I don't remember the creed because I usually disassociated (laughs) during the creed. Those moments were just very uncomfortable for me. And so I would disassociate, but like for the creed, like it talked about like believing in the virgin birth, the creation of the world by God in seven days, Christ dying on the cross. And all these core things of the New Testament and stuff. Oh, and that the Bible is an errant. There's no errors in the Bible. That was a big one that really bothered me. <laughs> okay. And yeah, there are uh, errors in the Bible. And in part because of the limited awareness of science, of uh, spectrums, I think also about how, you know, I used to teach in the, the Hebrew school where I was growing up. I taught a special needs class and we came across this passage in the Torah where it said that basically people with a defect are not allowed to be priests are not allowed to be leaders in the community. And here, that was the sort of the portion of the week. I thought, I cannot read this because there was this sense at the time, I think of it being a defect rather than just sort of natural human variation. And that for some people, it means nothing about their cognitive abilities, even if they can't speak like you can speak or whatever else. And that you want to also honor the harder work that they have to do to make it through the world as opposed to punish them for something also that is nothing that they've done. You know, it's just, it's nothing that they've done wrong, similar to, you know, being gay and lesbian trans, like it's the way you were born. The other part that I wanted to clarify is you said that you're living with another family and that your parents are paying for your therapy. So I'm trying to understand living with another family and also that they're still supporting you, which is, I'm glad to hear, I'm glad to hear that. I'm just trying to understand that. Yes, of course. So basically, I'll go into the very beginning of Bob Jones. First, my parents would not pay for any college if it wasn't Christian. But if it was a Christian college, they would pay for it. So they were using their money to manipulate me to go to a Christian college. And they wanted me to go to Pensacola Christian College, which is 
so much worse than Bob Jones. It is literally like a prison. And so Pensacola didn't really have what I wanted to study anyway, because I wanted to study filmmaking. And my brother, he was at Pensacola. So that's what really made my parents say, oh, your brother's there. He can help you. And re- after reading the rule book and just to see how controlling they were, I was like, I'm not going there because here's a, here's a couple of examples of how controlling they were. First, if you left campus, you had to sign out and tell them where you were going at what time and with who. Like, even if it was during the day, if you stepped off campus, they had to know where you were. And with who, so it's so ridiculous. And also you're not allowed to go to a local church there. They have a church for all the students on the campus to collectively go to. And it's like, okay, this is mind control. Like this is, this is not freedom in any shape or form. And it would have been basically almost, I mean, it would have been like, it wouldn't be any different from home really just going to this place. So I was like, I don't want to do that. And my parents, they were kind of, I'm sure about Bob Jones at first because Bob Jones does not take a KJV only stance. And my my parents did not like that at first. And they finally agreed to let me go. And they were like, they're like, Andrew, if you were going to study the Bible, we would not want you to go to Bob Jones because they don't claim the KJV as the legitimate Bible. But since you're doing an art major, it doesn't matter to us as much. And so that was when, you know, it was okay to go. And I was still scared about going to Bob Jones. They were still very strict, but not as bad as PCC. And so I tried to get out of going to Bob Jones. And that's the moment when I came out of the closet to my mother and I said, hey, like, you know, I I think I'm gay. I don't think I will fit into this environment. It'll be very hostile to me. And long, long story short, she was like, well, she's like, well, you're still going. And she's like, if you don't, I mean, you'll just have to stay here so you can pick. And so I was like, okay, I'll go then. She was like, okay. She's like, they can help you, I'm sure, with your problems or issues. And so I was like, all right. So it was scary going there. And, you know, I, I was bullied and I was harassed a lot my freshman year at Bob Jones University. And I tried to stay low key, but... You know, I was on a freshman floor with a bunch of immature guys who just graduated high school. So it wasn't really much different than what what I imagined a high school to be like, at least. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, I was I was surrounded by so many people that I was really so alone because I had no connection. Like I didn't feel that love and acceptance given back to me. And as human beings, we really need that. It's not just social interaction, but it's getting that love and acceptance back. And I just wasn't getting it there. And, you know, I suffered, I was so depressed that first semester. And even the second semester, it got really bad. And I just, I felt so hopeless because I have been trapped in this environment my whole life. And I'm like, how am I going to escape this? Like everyone I know in my life is in this environment. There's no, there's no way. And it was like, it's like, you're, you're duck in this abyss and you say no way out. And, you know, and that was when, you know, I was so depressed. I didn't imagine like even living the next day. And that's when I decided that I made a suicide video and I had a bottle of pills beside me. Cause like, I really, I thought that was it. Wow. And so after making the video, it really, in a way, it was like talk therapy for me because I released all this energy. And so I was like, okay, I feel better after just saying all these things. And then I called Trevor Hotline, which is an LGBTQ hotline for people with mental health. So they helped me. And, you know, at this point, I sometimes forget how even at 18 years old, I was still so indoctrinated because one of my main reasons to go to Christian college was I, I was so afraid of disobeying my parents because growing up in the church, I was always told like, oh, if you obey your parents, you'll live long. The Lord will bless you. So there's this fear around you had to do everything your parents said or the, the God wouldn't bless you or he would punish you. So that was another fear. That's one of the reasons I went there because I was so scared. Um, I had that fear that they used to control me with. And also I was like, I didn't, I didn't know of what else to do. And, you know, going to Bob Jones, it was good for me because I, I got away from my parents and I was able to truly get a chance 
to think for myself. And once I got there and I realized that I had conformed to fundamentalist Christianity because it was the only way I could get love and validation from my parents. And that's when I realized that it was shattering because we're, as human beings, we're really bad at deceiving ourselves and lying to ourselves. Like, oh, I believe this because we don't want to deal with those uncomfortable feelings of what's really going on inside of us. We can repress things. And so once I started realizing that, And, you know, growing up, my parents, they never explicitly said, we're not going to love you if you don't submit to our beliefs. But things were implicitly implied for the way they treated me in certain ways. And so that's what I've been learning in psychology, that, you know, most of our communication is nonverbal. And it always bothers me when people say, well, oh, I didn't I didn't explicitly say that. And I'm like, well, you said it through the way you treated me and through your body language. So actions do speak a lot of words. And it always bugs me when I would call my parents or after I, I got kicked out, I call my parents and I started just constructively criticizing some of the things they did in my childhood. And they were just immediately defensive. And they were like, oh, we didn't, ex- we didn't explicitly say that. So when they started gaslighting me, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to continue doing this. Like, I just need to go into therapy. <laughs> so, and what really, really made me angry was when after I got kicked out, I had called them once already to tell them I got kicked out. And then a week later, they called me back and they were like, oh yes, by the way, your dad and I, we think you have bipolar disorder and we want you to get on medication as soon as possible. So I was like, are you serious? I suffered so much in my teen years and they wouldn't take me to a doctor for medication. And now all of a sudden they're like, oh yes, you're bipolar, get on medication. And once I talked, I talked to my guardian about it and she was like, it sounds like they're trying to blame this on an illness than actually look at themselves and wonder how they cause this. It, it's, it's too uncomfortable for them. So they looks like they just search the internet <laughs> for something that's similar to what I did. Because, I mean, I can understand why they might have thought that because getting kicked out of school, that's not like me. I was always such a goody two-shoes growing up. I followed every single rule. I did everything my parents always told me. And to have something like this happen was just out of character to them, at least. But deep down inside, for a long time, I had hated my life and how, you know, and sometimes I look back and I'm angry that I was so submissive and did everything my parents told me and believed things the church told me. But it's really hard. But, you know, I had to have compassion for my past self and be like, I was a different person. I was isolated from information. Like, I didn't know they were, I was dependent on them. So there was really, so that's why, because it's easy for us to forget (laughs) how we were in the past. Yeah. I'm very glad that you're able to look at it in a different way where you're not berating yourself. But what I think is really important is to know that you are going to follow certain ideas, certain beliefs that your parents have presented to you because it's part of your family. It's part of your community. You feel that it's from God. There's fear that's woven into not believing that way, right? So sometimes it's not even so much that you believe it. You're just afraid not to. Oh, yes. I love that. You're afraid not to. Yeah. I mean, they really put the fear into you. and you know, looking back, it was really, really life-changing for me to realize that my struggle with my depressive episodes and my anxiety was because of religious trauma. When I finally found that term, um, I think it was around 2018. I mean, I didn't really dig into it much then. I wasn't ready to dig into that. Like I was just starting college. I had all this other stress on me. I didn't feel like digging down. Like, and so I was like, you know what? I'm like, I will set this down. I won't worry about this now. And I wasn't really educated on mental health or psychology at all. So I didn't realize what was really how serious this issue really was. And so as a little overview for people, for me, for my religious trauma, I grew up in the church, basically just hating myself so much. Um, I had so much self-hatred because of the hateful messages they would use in the Bible against um, the LGBTQ community. I thought God was going to burn me or destroy me at any second as a child. And 
so and I, I you know I talked from Joshua Harris's show and I became I was really honest about some of the symptoms I was experiencing and I've been talking to my therapist about it and one of the extreme extreme coping mechanisms that developed was I developed uh, another personality because I hated myself so much that I couldn't stand to be that person and so another personality and I told my therapist, I was like, I would go about my day and I felt that I was somebody else completely different than Andrew. And I would come home and I would look in the mirror and I'd be shocked. And I told, I talked to my therapist. I'm like, is this disassociative identity disorder? Like, what is this? And he says, because I can remember the changes that I was aware all the whole time, at least that it couldn't have been that, but he told me it was an extreme reaction or a coping mechanism because of that self-hatred, it was my my mind, my psyche trying to survive, a survival instinct. And so I'm alive because I was able to believe that I was somebody else because I hated who I was so much. And, you know, it took me many years to truly love myself for who I am and to, to think of me and to not be repulsed by that. Like that, it took me a long time through <laughs> meditation and affirmations and to know that I am worthy of love. <laughs> you know what I mean? That I do deserve to be happy and that I'm not broken. And yesterday I was watching this show for the first time. It was it's called Prodigal Son. And I watched the pilot episode. And in it, like for those who don't know what it is, it's about a criminal um, or forensic psychologist who is hunting down serial killers. So he tries to understand what is going on in these people's minds, what drove them to these actions. And he's a very compassionate person and he ha- and he feels for these criminals. He, he realizes that there's something deeper going on there. And in the episode, he says, he was like, no one is born broken. Someone breaks us. And it was just so powerful to me. I was like, oh, it just chills. And I was like, it's so true. Like none of us are born broken. Someone breaks us, unfortunately. Yeah. There are two things about that that I wanted to say. One is that when you are berated, mistreated, abused, told there's something wrong with you, it doesn't change you. It makes you submerge who you are and hide who you are and feel ashamed and repressed. You're still who you are. You've just learned you can't be that to other people. It doesn't do what people are thinking that somehow it It's like this exorcism of the self. It just is a way to kind of put this heavy blanket on top. And that's something that a lot of former cult members actually talked to me about, that they had this cult persona and they had their persona and they've had to figure out how to release one for the other or merge the two, at least so that they have a cohesive self. It also happens that sometimes when people are mistreated when they're young or abused, you know, at a certain age, it doesn't make them necessarily hate the people who are doing that to them, it makes them hate themselves. Like, yeah, something must be wrong with me for them to treat me that way. And it's really sad because children don't know how to deal with those things. And other things in the church that traumatized me was like the fear of hell, like the graphic sermons and things that were told to me growing up. I don't know what would go through those people, people's minds to think, oh, we should, we should say this. I feel like every child has somehow accidentally burned themselves in some way because as children, you know, we, we're, we're curious, we touch things. And so when you tell a child that you're, they're going to burn forever, like we have that frame of reference. We know what it's like to burn just for a second. And so in our minds to imagine what it's like to burn forever. And so, so many children are scared into converting to this religion, like this fear of hell is so terrifying. And like, I had nightmares growing up of hell and staying up awake at night because these adults, like, this was true. And so to get over the nightmares, that's when, you know, I conformed to the religion. And of course those symptoms went away because what I've noticed in these environments is this manipulation tactic they use is called the fear and relief tactic. And It's where they put a big burden, a psychological burden or fear on top of you. And it's unbearable. And at the end of the sermon, they offer you the solution to take that burden that they put on you in the first place. They give you the problem and they give you the solution. And this recently happened at Bob Jones when I was there back in January. A preacher 
in one of the services, the whole sermon was him making everyone feeling like they were worthless, insignificant. He's like, you're just a pink blob in the universe. You know, none of y'all are going to amount to anything. And he just made this feeling of worthlessness on everyone. And at the end of the sermon, he's like, oh, yes, come to Jesus. This is where you'll find your perfect. And so, you know, after, you know, at one point, I had to just disassociate because I grew up around that. I'm like, I've had enough of that. Like, this is not, this is not love. This is fear and manipulation. And so that's a tactic they use. It's called the fear and relief. And they use that with hell too, to get people to come to the altar. They scare you so much with hell. And then they're like, oh, well, this is how you're not going to go there. Come and do this. And I look back at some of the aspects of it. And I really do see how those pastors really just wanted to build their ego, was just getting more attendance and getting more and more people to the altar because it made them feel like they were powerful, that they had control or an effect on people. And it's just insane to me. And, you know, so hell was very traumatizing to me as a child. Right. I think the other thing to respond to is this idea of being bipolar. You may or may not be, but what's important is that there are a lot of people who will send their family members to go get help and to go get fixed without there being an idea about the causal relationship. And so I think about how many times I would be sitting in my office and I feel like I would have this visual of a parent just sort of handing me this problem. Like here, here, take my child who somehow just has these issues. We're not sure where they go. We have no idea what, Uh, you know, and and yes, there are some people who are born with a certain kind of wiring and, you know, and it isn't caused by necessarily the familial situation, but most often it has an interplay with where they came from and how they were treated. But the parents aren't necessarily on board with saying, you know, we might need to learn about ourselves and what we need to address and how we may have created these emotional issues for our child. Either we did or we let that happen because of the environment we raised them in. You know, without that piece, then it's just the child feeling even more so that they're the ones with the problem. It's the nature versus nurture thing, especially in the environment they have such a black and white view. They can't understand that it could possibly be both. Like it could be both of those things, not like just one or the other. It could be both at the same time. And it's very possible for a lot of people. And, you know, other things looking back, you know, when I talked to other people, they were like, oh, well, you didn't just experience religious trauma. You experienced you no know, trauma in your family. And what I said to that was, well, their religion influenced them to treat me this way. So like that was a religion influenced all of this. And it was so, it's so relieving to find a label for things that happened to you growing up. Like um, negative enmeshment is a thing that was really big for me. And for those of you who don't know what enmeshment is, enmeshment is a role reversal in a child where the child becomes the parent and the parent becomes the child and the parent relies on the child for emotional needs. So that's just regular enmeshment. Negative enmeshment is where a parent sees something in a child that they do not like, and they try to bully or just get that out of them. And when I read about negative enmeshment, how parents can bully their children or just be mean to them because there are things in them they don't like and that they want to get rid of, like I experienced that a lot. And I don't think my dad fully realized what he was doing to me, but he was very harsh and mean to me as a child. And I would cry sometimes. He, he would be like, oh, he's like, I'm just helping you. He's like, the world is going to be such a mean and nasty place. Get used to it. So to him, he was just toughening me up, he thought. And there was a moment with, you know, when I was 16, when my depression got so bad where I stopped eating, I was in bed all the time. And like within two weeks, I lost like 20 pounds. Like it was really bad. It was very serious. It was a, definitely a major depressive episode. And, you know, and my parents, they were worried because they're like, they realized their child was like dying before their eyes, basically. Because, you know, if you don't eat, you're going to die. And so my mom didn't know what to do about it. And I remember it was one meal where I just couldn't eat. And my dad just got so angry with me and raised his voice at me 
to eat. He's like, why can't you just eat? And it just, it made things worse. He was just so angry. And my mom was over there just crying her eyes out. And I just left, I left the kitchen and I went to the bathroom and just cried on the bathroom floor because I just didn't know what to do. And they did, they didn't take me to a doctor at all. And I don't, I can't remember how I got out of it, but I somehow did. And, you know, and I think the re- the cause for it was, it was when I had fully for, I think from like 14 to 15, I had repressed my sexuality. And at 16, I had admitted to myself, okay, I think I am gay. And so because of all the hateful messages in the church that I've been told I suddenly, that was the beginning of that self-hatred for myself. So the thought of me was like awful. I hated myself so much that I just couldn't bear to exist. It was unbearable. And that's eventually, I think, I guess maybe that's how I developed personalities. That's how I got out of that then, to just disassociate. And like you said, it's never really gone. It's just repressed. (laughs) You're still there. You're just hidden away. You are still there, right? You're hidden away and it it is true. And you're right because you had that moment when you'd come back and see yourself in the mirror and you'd say, oh, wait, no, 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 that is is who I am. I'm still here. It's very disorienting. But yes, we do a lot to survive. And it actually is kind of a gift when you feel like there are no other choices. And that's the problem because you don't realize when you're young, there are other choices. It doesn't feel like it and it doesn't seem like it at all. So I don't know if you had a chance yet to go through the list that you had on your paper. So let's do that. And then I'll continue with whatever other questions I have. And also hope we'll touch on the idea of conversion therapy that exists within the church. So let's make sure to touch on that because that's something that I get asked about a lot to cover on this. Yeah. And I've had my experience with that. So I would definitely love to talk about that in a sec. So for the psychology of religion, and the reason I got into it is I really think it's important to understand different perspectives and to understand where people are coming from. And for me, it's helped me to have more compassion for my parents. If you can truly understand why people do things and why they behave, it's really hard to be hateful because it's easy to generalize. And you're like, oh, they're an awful person. But it takes character to look at someone and be like, there is something deeper going on there. And I want to understand what is going on inside of them. Part of that for me was understanding what my parents got out of this religion and what people in general, like what attracted them to fundamentalism? Like how could some people stay in this their whole lives? And for me, I was trying to understand my religious, well, I, at least what I perceive as spiritual or religious experience. I'm like, was this actually spiritual or was this psychological? And the first thing I want to touch on is the Holy Spirit. And they always talk about the Holy Spirit convicting you. And it was really scary to me as a child, had like believing that there's a spirit that inhabited you and would bother you about anything you did wrong, basically convict you. And there were moments in my childhood where I had, I had extreme anxiety and convictions about every little thing I did. And I did feel those tugs and those jabs. And I truly, I interpreted my feelings as the Holy Spirit. But as I got older and I learned in psychology, I think it's called a conditioned reflex. And it's about where if you're exposed to a certain stimuli or stimulus around a certain thing and you have the same emotional reaction, when you're exposed to that thing in the future, you will have that same emotional reaction. It triggers it. So it's just like a triggering of a memory. And so when I would get those tugs in the future, I'm like, I'm triggered by this, not because of the Holy Spirit, because I was conditioned by this messaging. Like, for instance, in my childhood, like just listening to music that wasn't Christian. If I would have done that, I got made, I felt majorly bad about it. Not because it was actually bad, but because they had told me so many times over and over again. And even just for thoughts that I would have, I would just, and I realized I was like, I was just basically programmed and brainwashed. And when these things happening, even like if I'm not consciously aware, there's like in my unconscious, there are all, there's all this mess, like programming that's I'm trying to get rid of, which will probably never fully happen, but I'm trying to get the worst of it out of me. So the condition reflex is what I realized my issues with feeling, feeling bad about these certain things that they'll come out of nowhere. I'm like, okay, I've been conditioned to feel bad, even about things that aren't bad and just I have to logically think through things. And I think going into what attracts people to this environment, number one is 
connection and community. We're social beings. We want to find a group that we fit into. And so I think when we find these groups, we will conform to these groups to fit in. And so this is what I saw about it. I realized, I wondered, I'm like, why would no one question this? Why would no one dig deeper? And I realized because if they did, they might lose their community. So if they just conformed and went along, they would still have their community and they would be, feel safe and comfortable. Also, as human beings, for my second point, we have this need to feel special and unique. And I do believe everyone is unique, but I do think some people struggle to believe that, that they're actually important and that they do matter. And so you get into this religion where they tell you that God has a special plan for you. He knew you before he created the world. That's why you're here. He has his purpose. You need to push this religion. It gives this feeling of, oh, well, this God that exists in all the universe, he knew me. He created me. Like I'm special. And it makes people feel better about themselves. And and for some people, it can be healthy, like, oh, like I actually matter. And for some people, it can be an internet of fanaticism where they go to the extreme <laughs> and they're like, I am God chosen. You all listen to me. I am so much better than all of you. It causes this superiority complex. Basically, people can use this to feel better, even though deep down inside, unconsciously, they feel very inferior, but they're using this to feel superior to other people. And another thing from uh, my third point is it kind of leads into the feeling special and important, but a sense of purpose. You know, as human beings, we need, we, we're searching for our purpose. And I think some people in fundamentalism is so attractive because it's the absolute truth. This is the answer for all the world's problems. And it makes you feel like and you once you actually believe that, then you're set on this mission. Like, I'm going to spread this all over the world. This is the gospel is going to change the world for the better. And that's what I'm going to do. So, and a lot of people do struggle finding their sense of purpose and religion can give, fulfill that sense of purpose in them. And for me personally, I understand it from rationally. But like emotionally, I don't understand that because I've always felt a sense of purpose for myself. And I think that has to go into personality types too. And so I am an INFJ, which stands for introvert, intuitive, judging, feeling. And for um, INFJs, you know, we're known, we are intrinsically, we just have that sense of purpose. And so that's when I realized why I didn't feel that way. I was like, okay, I was like, I just, um, my personality type is just has that feeling already. And religion can't really add on to that for me. But these people, they lack that though. So that's why they latch on to this. And I think that's what it was also hard for me to go, especially as I got older, I was like in a service, I'd be like, is this really the purpose? for the human race is to just spread the gospel. Like, what about feeding the sick and the hungry? Even what the, Jesus talked about, I'm like, there are missionaries who do help do that. And there are Christians who do actually do that. And I acknowledge that. But there's so much emphasis on, there's so focus on the afterlife of eternity, which we can't really prove or disprove. What they're doing is they're neglecting the needs of people in the here and now. And that's what I see a lot. And I was like, why don't you take care of your fellow mankind right here and now? And to them, though, because it's so real, they're like, oh, well, eternity is so much more important. None of this really matters. And everyone had that point of view. The world would be a terrible place. There would be no progress for humanity if everyone thought that way. Right. No progress. No hospitals, no schools, no soup kitchens, no, no, no wheelchair ramps, nothing, no wheelchairs. But, and I also don't know why it has to be either or. I know. Why can't you be focused on both at least? Right. If it, if you believe in it, I know from my tradition, we're not, we don't really talk about heaven and hell. It is about living now and what do you do now? And that, that's why there's this whole idea of tikkun olam, which was repairing the world. Like, this is what we got. Let's work on it. What is also true, though, is that... They don't have to be mutually exclusive. If you do believe in an afterlife, a positive one or a negative one, yeah. <laughs> um, still, what about the person standing right in front of you who's suffering? What about your child who's standing right in front of you suffering? Mm -hmm, most definitely. And, you know, speaking of children, my next point is that, you know, we all have an inner child. And I think what makes religion so attractive for some people is there's this promise of protection of a father figure. And that inner child in this, like none of us, a lot of people in these environments, they don't truly want to be free because freedom means independence. 
and they want to be dependent on something. And so for them, it is the God of the Bible. He's this father who will care and love them. He gives them a sense of security. And if you follow these list of rules, he'll bless you, blah, 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 and all this. So it gives them security. Like, oh, if I do this, there's this higher power looking out for me, this father figure. So that part of themselves just connects to that. And especially to people who have bad relationships with their parents and who are vulnerable emotionally, like it's, this is very attractive. And they try to fill these holes in themselves with these ideologies. And I think the last point for the general psychology behind it was a, just a sense of feeling, at least, of certainty. And like the fear of death, like he, a lot of people are afraid of death. And for some people, this can calm that fear, that psychological discomfort, like, oh, like, it, OK, I said this prayer. I'm going to heaven. I'm good. And if I do this and the thing is with the church especially that I grew up in, they would try to make you doubt your salvation too. They were like, oh, if you're experiencing this and this and this, you might not really be saved. And I think it's just how they, that's how they kept people in the fold too. Cause you know, once you're saved, in the, the tradition I grew up in, like you have that ticket the rest of your life. And so in that sense, why go to church then anymore? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's like, if you can go to heaven, then why do you, so they have to make you doubt it. And there are people who do go back to church because they get spiritual or at least emotional fulfillment from that. And I do understand that, like, because I realize there are healthy churches, but for these churches and fundamentalism, I'm like, and like you said earlier, like you're afraid to not believe really. And that really resonated with me. And I realized a lot of these people, they have these fears. And then even though they're exposed to these toxic things at the end of the day, the preacher is going to provide a solution and to comfort these fears in their lives and the burdens they put onto them. Yeah, I sort of call it what if theology. What if they're right? What if that's true? That's somehow enough, just because it's so laden with fear, that that's enough to keep people kind of hanging on because the consequence isn't something like, well, you just might have a bad day. It's you're going to burn forever, right? Okay, so hello. All right, so what if they're right about that? If it is so great and awful and terrifying, then who wants to take the risk? Yes, most definitely. Uh, I was watching something recently about um, a person actually who lives not far from me who was adopted by a family as he was transitioning to trans female and was actually living just three blocks away from her home of origin. Uh, which was a little weird uh, that the family that took her in was helping her still continue uh, her high school education and then taking her to Children's Hospital for treatments and for therapy and and that she would still pass by her house where her parents had said, this is just too much for us to go live with this other family who were av availing themselves of people who needed that environment. So I was curious about that and also just about conversion therapy, because it's something that other people who have been on have talked about not being accepted the way they were being shunned, but the process of what is it like? What did you experience or what did you hear about happening within your church? Yeah. Um, so first I'm going to go into talk about that family that I'm dealing with, and then I'll go into the conversion therapy part. So that year of college, when I made that suicide video, and, you know, I called Trevor Hotline and I calmed down. I knew deep down inside, and this was a really crucial moment for me, is this is the first moment I decided to start trusting myself because I didn't trust myself for a long time because I was taught that my heart was deceitful and that I was wicked and that I needed to trust in the Lord. And so this was the first moment where I was like, you know what? It was hard for me, but I said, I need community, people who truly care about me. This is what I'm longing for, what I've longed for for so many years because I haven't had that true connection. And so I was like, I can't find this at Bob Jones. Where can I find this? So long story short, I found an affirming church that accepted LGBTQ people. And, you know, I see the way the universe worked things out for me. So as I look back that day, I went, I visited, and it was honestly almost towards the end. I was like, I don't know about this. Like, I didn't, I felt out of place. I wasn't vibing. There weren't that many young people, college kids my age. And then the church at the end announced, oh, we're having a visitor's luncheon. So I was like, you know what? I'll go to that. I'll, I'll meet people. 
And that was when I met the family, the mom and her daughter that I live with now. And I told them about my situation at Bob Jones and they started to get to know me more. They invited me to their house and they literally live right by Bob Jones a block away. So I could easily walk to their house. And so once they got to know me, they gave me a key to their house and they're like, you can walk away from Bob Jones and come here anytime you like. So they were that safe haven for me while I was there. And so that was really incredible. And I would have I would have dinner with them sometimes. And, you know, it was really difficult because then the pandemic happened and that kind of had to end for their own safety and my own safety too. So that I know it hurt, the pandemic hurt a lot of people and just you know, even like the LGBTQ people who had to go back to these situations that they weren't really safe or comfortable in. Anyways, isolated. So I still continue to keep in contact with them during all of that. And like, I almost, I didn't see them for like a year and a half because of the pandemic. And, but I still kept in contact with them. And so when they saw the Josh Harris video, this was back in early January of this year, they were like, Andrew, they're like, we think you're going to get kicked out for this. And they're like, we want you to know that if you do that, we have a room for you. So you don't have to go back home. And so It was incredible. And I thanked them. And I said, hopefully that I wouldn't get kicked out because it was my last semester at Bob Jones. And I would have been, I would have, that was a senior. I was graduating in May. (laughs) And so, you know, I did the precautions that I could to not get kicked out. I blocked a bunch of people on Instagram that I thought would snitch on me. So I'm like, okay, I'll block this. So I tried to put these safeguards up, but I didn't want to hide my story. You know what I mean? Like I still went on the show. And I did it, but I did what I needed to. So when I found out I got kicked out, that was on the 17th. I think I moved in. It was There was a snowstorm here. So they couldn't get out of their driveway for a couple of days. So I think on the 19th, January 19th was when I actually moved in with them. And, you know, it's been incredible. It's been, it's, it's a healthy environment because I grew up in an emotionally dysfunctional family where we didn't talk about emotions. We weren't allowed to express anger and we weren't allowed to have opinions. And now it's just... I can relax and like spiritually, emotionally just breathe. And it's incredible. And that's the short version of that story. And I'll go into the conversion therapy part. That was when at school, I basically, I think that was my fourth depressive episode. It happened my junior year. So it was in the fall or actually starting the summer of 2020. And it lasted from like July to like, January. <laughs> oh no. That is so, a really long depressive episode. I'm so sorry. Yeah, that is. And so in desperation, basically, as you know, I wanted to go to therapy, but I was a college student with no car. I was so busy with my homework and my two other jobs. I don't have time or the money for that. And Bob Jones University, they don't have any qualified people there. They just have biblical counselors, Christian counselors there. So they don't have anyone who has a psychology degree counseling people. <laughs> so my mom was like, why don't you go? To-? They have a biblical counselor there. And I was told her, I'm like, I don't trust biblical counseling. I'm like, I don't think they're qualified. And she was like, just at least go to someone to talk about it. And so I was like, you know what? For I mean, this is, I was desperate. I was aware of what could happen and I expected the worst and like, that's what I got. (laughs) And, (laughs) and what happened was this guy was genuinely, he was a nice guy. The first session was literally, it was just hearing my story and what I was just hearing me get just basically just talking. That's when I eventually I came out of the closet to him. And like, that was a big step to do that to a Bob staff. And I was like, at that point, I was like, I don't really care if they kick me out. It's like, you know, I'm depressed. And if they really, they're going to do that just because I exist, like, you know, forget them. And so after I told him about how I was mistreated by different people in the church and people I grew up with um, and all these different experiences I had, he looked at me and he has said, oh, he's like, I see that you've been paying for your sin. I was bullied a lot growing up in churches. He basically, he, that was his way of saying that I deserved what happened to me. And so in that moment, I sat there and I wasn't really shocked. You know what I mean? Because there is a lot of victim blaming with Christian counseling. Like, oh, it's your fault. Like, you're not praying enough. Or God is punishing you. Like, God is just this big burden that can just put on you. 
you know, when, when he said that, like, it was like a stab in the heart. And I'm like, are you serious right now? It's like, I, it didn't surprise me, but I'm like, I was hoping a little bit me hoping if there could be some kind, loving Christian who could understand, but no, he cared more about his personal beliefs than me and his beliefs reflected in what he said, honestly. And he clearly had prejudice against LGBTQ people. And Bob Jones does anyways. They hire people who agree with that. Anywho, but so basically when I told him that I wasn't a Christian, he's like, oh, well, we did, I think, two sessions. And if you're a Christian counselor and someone comes to you that I'm a Christian, you're told to not counsel them anymore, just to send them on their way. So he's like, yeah, he's like, I really can't help you because you don't have the Holy Spirit or Christ inside of you. <laughs> so, so I, I moved along and I still struggled with depression my second semester that year. And so that's when I was basically so desperate. And so for the fifth time in my life, I made a, um, you know, I said this sinner's prayer of asking Jesus into my heart just to try to express and get these burdens off of me. And like what happened was, and this is the tricky thing about fundamentalism is that they have very mixed messaging. There are some weeks where they are super loving and there are some weeks where they're so, so, or most of the weeks are so hateful. So this happened at Bob Jones. There are some weeks they're very hateful in their preaching. And there are some weeks that they're so loving. And so they got me in a sermon that was actually really loving. And it just touched my heart and it painted this very beautiful picture of God. And it just made me cry because that's what I, I really needed love. It got that part of me that was just needing love. But, and so I had that salvation experience. So I went back to Mr. Burke and I told him what happened. He's like, oh, okay, I'll counsel you now. Uh-huh. Okay. Right. So now you're qualified to receive the counseling. Yeah. Apparently I had the Holy Spirit in quotes in me. So anything is possible. and. So what happened was he's like, Andrew, he's like, what I want to do is I want to disciple you. And so basically it was just, I was accountable to him for my Bible reading and my prayer life. And he was trying to help me grow, I guess, in what Bob Jones thought a Christian would be. That's just what I'm going to say, because I know there are different interpretations. So he was trying to make me a Bob Jones Christian. And so he's like, and when he's like, I want to disciple you this semester, he's like, towards the end of the semester, he's like, um, I want to start going and trying to change your sexuality because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. So anything is possible. We can change your sexuality. And so at that point, I wasn't comfortable with that, but he didn't want to get into that yet. So it was just discipleship. And I was generally curious about the wisdom that he had of the Bible and what he had to say. And towards the end of the semester, when it was finally the first session of actual trying to change my sexuality. And he had already given me a book too to read that I already read about someone who supposedly became straight. And once I read the book, the person, they even the person admitted that they still had those thoughts, but they were basically, they didn't say this, but they were repressing who they were. They were still, that person was still inside of them. Like we were talking about earlier, but they were just repressing it. And that's their, I guess, that's what they see as being cured in their sense is just, there's no outward expression, but that doesn't change the inside. Just because you change outside behavior, it doesn't change who you are on the inside at all. And so to them, if they're like, oh, if you're not pursuing these relationships, then you're cured, you're straight. And it's like, no, that doesn't change who you are on the inside at all. And so after the first session, and what I tell people is, I generally, I, ne- I never remember, I don't remember what happened in the first session because I generally believe I disassociated because I could not emotionally handle what was going on. And so after that first session, I texted him and I told him, I'm like, my intuition is telling me that this is not okay, that this is not safe or a healthy thing to do. And it's like, I don't, I'm like, I thanked him for his, him discipling me, but I didn't want to continue further with this thing of trying to change my sexuality. And he was like, oh, he's like, oh, he's like, let's get together again and talk about this. And I was like, no, like I started to really set my boundary with people. I'm like, I'm not like, I, I, I knew what I needed and what was best for me. That was not it. That was not what I needed. And when I generally, so when I realized why conversion therapy is so harmful is because number one, you're teaching a person to hate a part of themselves. And number two, you are destroying the humanity in us that wants love and connection. Like if you teach someone 
to cut off that part that wants love and connection, you're really killing people. You're driving them to suicide because as human beings, we need that community, we need that love and that connection. And when you teach someone to hate that part of themselves, I mean, what purpose? But why would you want to live if you can't love, love or be loved? You know, if you can't be yourself, why even live? You know what I mean? Like you need that so desperately. So that's what they're doing and really conversion therapy. I know there are different methods, but they all lead to the same thing, no matter how they do it, how extreme they go. And so it's really sad. And even there's so much scientific evidence of how harmful this is psychologically, but there's still these people because these fundamentalists, their extreme thinking of we have the answer, our beliefs are right, our God is all powerful, he can do this. And what also bothered me is that they believed that their God would care enough to change someone's sexuality, but he would let all these people suffer around the world in starvation and all these diseases. But he cares enough to try to change my sexuality. Like that is so messed up to me. I thought about that. Like it shows how much really it reflected their own bias, honestly. And once I thought about that, I'm like, first, I want to bring up this song. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's called God is a Freak. <laughs> God is a Freak? No, I don't have it on my Spotify playlist. <laughs> what, what is it? It went viral on TikTok. And it sounds disrespectful, but really what the song is about is how people have projected God as having these different priorities and how messed up they are. We're, you know, like how God is obsessed with our thoughts and our sex life. And in the song, she's like, he's like, what, like, these are messed up priorities. Why is he worried about this? That's really like, God is such a freak if he's worrying about my sex life. You know what I mean? So it was like, people might perceive that a lot of people, Christians have perceived that as disrespectful. But from my perspective, I see that she was projecting or showing how people have used God to control people or be like, oh, well, God's watching you do this and this. She's like, well, if that's really who God is. He's really messed up. It is kind of to some people might be blasphemous or sacrilegious, but I, you know, if you look past some of the things and she explains in the song, she's like, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm just trying to understand like, why, why is this guy caring about these things that really don't matter? Like there are other things happening in the world. And so that's really what blew my mind is how, Really, these fundamentalists and Christians are projecting their own like biases on their God. And they're saying, our God is this. And so that's when I started seeing past that and understanding at the core of it, like these are very sad, fragile people who are just looking for comfort. And they've gone to these systems and it's psychologically they do. There is a psychological thing that is happening inside of them that gives them this feeling of superiority. And and also it feels good to be right. It does like, oh, or to think you're right, at least like, oh, I'm right. And when it's well, there's comfort, there's certainty and a need for community. And there's all these different tactics they use in the church to keep them in the fold. Like we talked about hell and the um, the fear. And like, even if you don't follow their rules, like, oh, like God's going to punish you. And I talked with my therapist recently and I was like, I was scared as a child because if you sinned, God would punish you. And then if you did, if you were righteous, God would punish you through testing and trials and tribulations. So no matter what you do, you're going to suffer. So it's like, it's like, you know, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And so, and like the story of Job really scary growing up of how God just tested and let these terrible things happen because he was a good person. So it's like, to me, I look at that as a child and I was like, we're going to suffer no matter what. And it's such an awful place to be in, to think that. And it's been hard deconstructing these beliefs. But I think for me and for anyone else out there who is struggling, really, you have to learn for me to, in order to do that. You have to learn to trust yourself and to get, get like you're disconnected from yourself, really, in these environments and just connect with yourself and learn to trust and evaluate and don't act on your impulse or feelings. Try to balance that ration and emotion out when you make decisions and things. And there are lots of resources and books out there. And like I know, like for my situation, I was trapped and I couldn't get those resources for a long time. And like for people who are listening to this and who are trapped, I mean, I just want to say that I know what it's like to feel absolutely hopeless and that there's no way out. But, and it's, 
it's easy to stay in the fold because it's familiar, even though it's toxic and it's harmful, it's familiar. But I just want to say for anyone out there that there is a world or community out there somewhere that will love and accept you for who you are and where you can actually be safe. And you can find the courage to find that. And I wouldn't be here if I never found that myself. And so that's why I feel it's so important to tell my story because, you know, I mean, I, I've even told my the family I've lived with, I was like, I don't know if I would be here anymore if I never met you. Like, you're why I'm still alive. And that's why I am so passionate about talking about spiritual abuse and all these toxic environments because no one is, people are talking about it, but more people need to speak up and start this revolution, which is happening though. It really is happening. We're in the midst of a revolution happening online, the deconstruction community and pastors are reacting to it. And I haven't heard pastors address religious trauma yet. It's an issue they're still ignoring. And I feel like that's part of my purpose is to get people to speak up about the issues because the more people who speak up, they can't ignore it anymore. Right. Oh, and I'm so glad. I am so glad that you're still here (laughs) and and that you've come through, you've come through the fire, right? Yeah. Um, (laughs) Right. And things have kind of cooled down a bit, which is really nice. They have. And right. I think people are afraid of addressing it sometimes within a religious context, because I think they might not see that really we're not saying and you're not saying all religion is evil. No, no. And or even Christianity is bad. What you're saying is. These things can happen, though, within a religious context. And when God is invoked and the fear of God is invoked, it can wreak havoc in people's lives and give them trauma. So be cautious about this. Yes. Um, I think it's very specific. But thank you so much for your time, for all the work that you're doing. Where can people see the video that you did and anything else you would like them to be able to to know that you're doing online? Yeah. So. All of my work, I usually put on my Instagram account, which is Andrew Pledger. And the A is a four, Andrew Pledger. And I'm starting my own show. It's called Speaking Up. And it's where I interview people who have survived toxic religious settings. Okay, cool. So thank you for having me and sharing my story and my journey. All right. Wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. Thank you for having me, Rachel. One more thing before you go. This is a different kind of outro today. Actually, Rob, who's part of the podcast team producer, had a really interesting idea about me having a conversation for this outro with Andrew himself, because since the time that we recorded our conversation for the podcast, you've become part of the podcast team as well. And it's been wonderful. Andrew is very talented and very devoted to this work. And so it seemed like a great opportunity to not just have me talk about what you talked about, but to actually talk to you and find out how life has changed since then, what you've been up to, what's been on your mind. And I think it's a great idea. So let's get cooking. So tell me what would be good to to go over during this short period of time that we have to talk. Yes. So first, I just want to thank you for having me on the team. It has been so incredible um, to work for you and the podcast. Because for me, like I am a very purpose-driven person and I need a job that aligns with my mission and my purpose. So this has been a fantastic um, opportunity and job to connect with different people and help different people in these situations. And so I think I definitely like, there's been a lot of updates in my life and things that have gotten to happen. And so of course, you know, working for the indoctrination podcast was a big thing. But when I escaped um, fundamentalist Christianity back in January, I think I'd mentioned, I know I've been in therapy since then. So I've been in therapy for six months now since January, and it's just been so incredible. And I'll probably be in therapy for years, but that's fine. (laughs) I love therapy. Anyways, it's so good. I've also recently started my podcast called Speaking Up um, with Andrew Pledger. 
And I started it because I realized how um, healing and how important and empowering it is for people to share their own stories. And so I wanted to use that as an outlet to reach out to other people who wanted to share their stories because the more people we can get really to speak up, the more change I think that is going to happen. So another big update is that I've been accepted into SNHU um, online, which is Southern New Hampshire University and 90 credits transferred through. Um, So I'm going to graduate in May of 2023 because of the experiences that I've had with religious trauma and talking with other people and realizing that there's very little research into religious trauma. I really um, want to become a therapist to help religious trauma survivors and also a psychologist to help research and get that data behind religious trauma and hopefully find some kind of modality to help people work through it because it's such a specific kind of thing. And there are a lot of people really suffering in silence with this. And another thing, you know, when I left was that I took several months to just work on personal growth and my mental health, really. And one of those things was continuing to write my book, which I've been writing since I was 19. And it was just for me, just a way, originally it was just me processing and getting everything out that I've been through. And then once I just started writing it more and more, I'm like, okay, I think people can actually relate to this. And I think as I kept writing and as I kept learning things about myself and about religious trauma and having all these personal breakthroughs, I'm like, okay, I think this could really help people. Wow. That's quite exciting. You're prolific. I'm wondering just from the time that we first talked, it was an unfamiliar thing, I think, for you to do just to speak the truth about what happened and to not be afraid of that. And anyone listening would understand why you'd be fearful, especially after what you've been through. And so when you were talking just before about a trauma response, what have you noticed that's been different, if it has been different, now that you've been speaking more? Or what is it that you, and this is not to say that I think everyone needs to speak and everyone needs to tell their story. I never want people to feel pressure that that's sort of where I'm going with this, but that for some people, part of their healing is putting words to their experience and having people hear them and dealing with the anxiety that comes up from telling what had been termed as something you're supposed to keep secret. So how has that changed for you over time? How have you made it easier for yourself, I guess, to say those things? The first time telling my story was very scary for me, but I felt like once I told it, like I was confident in it and I I knew there would be people who would try to invalidate my experiences, but I didn't really worry about that because I know what I've been through and I've been with around other people who have been through similar things. And I realized that nasty things that people say about you really says more about them than actually you as a person. They're projecting things onto you. And so that was a hard thing with leaving because a lot of people said a lot of terrible things about me when I left the religion, which is pretty common when you leave a religion or cult, they slander you. And they really tried to erase my existence. Someone someone told me that like any pictures or any names of me anywhere of anything I did on the campus, they tried to remove it. <gasps> oh. <laughs> I was like, okay, wow, I really upset. A lot. That really does say a lot about their mindset and their ideology. And it is a very, Bob Jones is a very cult-like environment and and anyone who has been there will testify to that. But it's been interesting to leave because once I noticed myself leaving, I felt so much more calmness in my nervous system. I didn't realize how dysregulated my nervous system was until I left. Like I knew I was stressed, but you know, when all you know is stress and chaos... (laughs) And you have nothing to compare it to. (laughs) You just don't know. And so when you finally get in the calm, you're like, it kind of feels uncomfortable. It feels scary to feel safe (laughs) when all you've known is unsafety (laughs) or being unsafe. Um, So yeah, that was hard for me um, to do. And I talked with my therapist a lot about that. I'm like, this feels really uncomfortable. (laughs) Like, I don't know what to do. (laughs) And, you know, it's been interesting leaving that environment and now seeing how Christian nationalism and this very fundamentalist extremist ideology is now starting to take over in America. And I think, you know, pretty much all of America knows that Roe v. Wade was overturned June 24th. It was overturned. 
And people have known this is something that the religious right has wanted to do for decades. But I think, you know, that's just the beginning. Roe v. Wade is just the beginning. That was not the final goal for them. And just to see all the different rights that the Supreme Court is going to go after, like consenting adults having sex, coming after that, <laughs> birth control. Um, I know like they are, they were giving rel- the funding to religious schools now. And I know they recently allowed like prayer in schools as I know specifically as like individual expression, but I feel like that individual expression is going to be used to coerce people into group things. I can just totally see that happening. It's been really devastating to see how, oh my gosh, like I finally escaped this environment, this ideology, but then that same ideology is probably going to end up infiltrating the government soon and being used to control people because, you know, at Bob Jones, they really, really control people's behavior. And that is a big part of cults is that they're very big on the behavior. And, you know, it was an awful environment because, you know, I was gay and this environment was very heteronormative, very patriarchal, very authoritarian. And so now it looks like the Supreme Court is going to just favor rights of people who are white, cis, Christian males. <laughs> That's, and this just makes me so angry to see that happening. And, you know, when I heard the news, like I did get like really depressed. But then when I finally got through my sadness, I'm like, well, I'm like, this is more motivation to keep fighting <laughs> for this separation of church and state and to hold religious institutions accountable. Wow. Beautifully said. I mean, it's nice to, even though on a large scale, things that are happening that are really very upsetting, but still day to day, just being able to go places, do things. And so just as we're kind of finishing up where there are some firsts that you wanted to be able to talk about. Yeah. I want to slowly like try different things. And like, one of the things I've tried is I went to my first pride parade last week, which is so exciting. It was a really great experience. And it was the first city sanctioned pride parade in Greenville, South Carolina, which I was glad to be a part of. And that was exciting. And I went to like a women's protest that day too, because Roe Way was overturned that day. So there was a pride parade. There was, there was a lot going on in Greenville and in the world <laughs> that day. You were talking to me a little bit about this, and I'm I'm wondering also, you know, when you were saying to me about the, uh, the police presence there, there are a lot of people who have had these transformative moments when in the past they've gone places and the police were not there to protect them. The police were like coming in and raiding gay bars and taking people to jail, or the police were there, you know, attacking African Americans or sticking their dogs or hoses on African Americans. And suddenly, when you have police there, however you feel about the police, but they're there for you. Yes. It Mm -hmm. changes. That was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That that is true. And like, and that's the thing that scares me the most is I feel like we're gonna go back to those days when the police are after. gay people and people in the LGBTQ plus community, but I hope it won't get to that. But I feel like though, even though this religious minority in our government has this extremist ideology, like a majority of Americans, you know, they support same-sex marriage and LGBTQ plus rights. And uh, most Americans do support Roe v. Wade too. So I think even you have these terrible things happen, there's going to be people that are still going to help those in need, I think, in America. Mm. Wow. Okay. So I'm so glad that we had a chance to speak with each other, to have the, therefore, like, oh, now what? Now this is how he is now. And this is how life has changed. But also that, you know, you're enjoying certain freedoms. And then we're still with the concerns about the government and and the direction that things are going in. You're going to be sensitive to it, sensitized to it, and be very watchful of it and just as a lot of us are so fingers crossed that things go in a good way and beyond just fingers crossed which is nice but passive you're doing something you're teaching you're addressing it and that can also feel good and can make a difference so thank you thank you andrew for all that you're doing on your own and also for becoming part of the team to help with the podcast a lot of the the social media that people are seeing for the podcast they have Andrew to thank for it. So thank you. Thank you. Of course. And where can people find what you're doing outside of the podcast too? Oh yeah. So like I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and also on TikTok. And like, there's a link tree 
and like every single one of my bios that can lead you um, to those links and also my website too. That's how you can find me. Okay. And so we'll put all those in the bylines for the show. All right. Very good to speak with you. Oh, yes. Thank you for having me on again. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.